Thank you so much for asking me some questions. Today is a video where I answer your questions through either Patreon, Instagram, or YouTube. Let's get into it. Question number one comes from Michael Quatrella off of my Patreon page. Thank you, Michael, for being a patron. If you want to become part of the best hi-fi community in the world, check out patreon.com slash cheap audio man. We have patron-only Zooms, patron-only Facebook group, patron-only Discord. Michael's question is, can you explain why many say a bookshelf speaker is a better center channel than a dedicated center channel, channel speaker? A lot of people say when you just take an MTM speaker and you lay it on its side, you don't get as good of dispersion. So a regular bookshelf has a tweeter on top of a woofer generally, so the dispersion is better. And if you look at a lot of higher end center channel speakers, a lot of times you will see basically a little bookshelf speaker often flanked by two woofers on either side. So that type of design is used in some center channel speakers, and I would argue that those types of center channel speakers are just as good as a regular bookshelf speaker. But if you're on a budget, a lot of times, a little bookshelf speaker used as a center speaker is sometimes better than a dedicated center channel speaker. I have used in the past little tiny RSL satellite speakers for center channel speaker, and it's worked out great. If you look at the old Bose Q, Custamass systems. I mean, their center channel speaker was like two inches by two inches. Steve Gray, another one of my longtime patrons, asks, what's the usual trajectory of viewer numbers from posting a video through the hours, days, and weeks after? Depends on, depends on how good the video is. Generally speaking, now it's also different for me because I've been doing this for four years. So generally when I release a video, I get a spike in views and then that starts to settle down 10, 12 hours a day and almost always a video will go up and then I'll just kind of dwindle into the abyss, never to be seen again. However, if it is a good video, and when I say a good video, I mean the viewers, you decide if it's a good video or not, I will generally see it stay pretty steady and then after a couple of days, it may start to go up again. It almost always happens on a multiple of a week, but a video will take off. I've had a video take off three months, six months, sometimes a year after it's been posted. I did one video called the 10 best or the best EQ settings for music, and that video didn't take off until almost six months after I posted it. So it all just depends, but most of my videos spike the first day and then just go into nothing. <laughs> this comes from my Instagram, jwonkyweak736, any budget class AB monoblocks out there. Sound quality difference between class AB and DZ amps, I think class D amps. Uh, the most affordable, I think, monoblocks out there I think is the Outlaw, and they come in about $400 a piece. You can also look at the A1 monoblocks from Emotiva, which with discounts come in, I don't know, $850, $900 a piece. I don't know of any out there that are really affordable, like something two, $300 or less, maybe something on AliExpress. If anybody knows of any, please put it in the comments. Differences between class AB and class D. Well, it really depends on a variety of things. The chipset used, the front end on that amplifier, the power supply used. I've heard a lot of terrible Class D amplifiers, and I've heard a lot of great Class AB amplifiers. A lot of times I feel like the Class ABs just have more current on tap than the Class Ds, but I think those are getting better and better. I mean, you have some really high-end stuff from Hypex, from Ice. NAD is using Class Ds almost exclusively, and a lot of Class AB amplifiers use toroidal transformers. Heck, Class D amplifiers use toroidal transformers, but let's be honest. The reason a lot of people like Class D is because it's 
cheaper and it's lighter and it's more modular. People could go on and on about the benefits, the sonic improvements, but it comes down to it's cheaper to ship from China and less expensive to make. Another one from Instagram, audio mania underscore hi-fi. Hey Randy, do you have creative blackouts? How do you overcome them? Cheers. Thanks, Audiomania underscore hi-fi. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, there's a great book out there called Atomic Habits, and if you haven't read it, I'd highly recommend it. I'm going to link it in the description. That will be an affiliate link, which means if you click and you buy that book, I get a commission, but it doesn't cost you anymore, so it's a great way to support the channel. There was a part in that book where it said the differences between a professional and an amateur is that a professional is going to do something whether they feel like it or not. And it comes down to behaviors. But what I do, and I was doing it today, is I come up with just lists of video ideas. Because sometimes I'm inspired, sometimes I'm not inspired. But if I keep adding to that list, then at any given point, I'm going to have 20 or 30 videos that I can grab from as far as ideas. Because I don't always have great ideas. But I that's a exercise that I participate almost daily. I also have a routine in the morning where I lay out what I need to do for that day. And I'm in a very charmed position because I get to do this for a living. And so that is just part of my work. I get up, I get my notebook, I open it up, I list the things I need to do that day. I list a few things and I, I would like to do that day and just prioritize from there. But to answer your question, absolutely I have times when I'm not creative or I have a creative blackout. But if I'm doing the things that I should be doing every day, it doesn't matter. And a lot of times I'll talk to people and iterate on different ideas. If I'm talking to other people, great ideas always kind of spawn from that. My boy, Wirehead, all the way from the great Canadian wilderness. Um, vintage Radio Shack Realistic Minimus 7 speakers as height and or surround speakers on modern systems. How about FunFi level amps and streamers with these kinds of smaller vintage speakers? As a note, I just picked up a used pair of vintage Bose 201s from 84 that are connecting to a Wiim amp and use my bedroom after some reno work. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a pair of Minimus realistic speakers that I was using as Atmos speakers that I was bouncing off of the ceiling. One of my patrons, Steve, long-term patron, sent those to me. I love realistic because... That's the type of equipment that I bought early on. But absolutely, let's just be honest. It's not like there's been a huge leap in speaker technology. And those small speakers have really heavy duty cabinets for their size. So they're actually really, really good. They may not make a ton of bass, but from a treble and a mid-range point of view and the size of that speaker, you're not going to get a lot of resonance. So I think those are great for satellite speakers. The Mica RB42 reminds me kind of like a current version of the realistic minimus speakers. Another one from YouTube, Marcos Garcia, 90. When it comes to audio quality, how and where do you draw the line on good enough? I mean, ultimately that's up to you. I think a lot of inexpensive equipment is good. I think when it struggles is when you try to run difficult loads on amplifiers or a DAC is not that great on the top end or your speakers aren't revealing enough. The good news is that if you're buying a lot of affordable products, the speakers probably aren't going to be able to resolve all that detail anyway. The litmus test really is, are you enjoying it? Does it move you emotionally? Is it good enough for you? Because this is a never ending journey. There's always gonna be something newer. There's always gonna be something better in some people's opinion. But if you enjoy it and you're listening to the music and it's giving you that emotional escape from the real, real world, if it's giving you chills, then it's good enough. But let's also be honest, most of us are here because we're gearheads too. It's not just about the sound. We love 
gear, whether it's watches or cars or guitars or guitar amplifiers, cameras, we love gear and we love the newest stuff. We just so happen to use that gear to play music. But if you're watching this video, you're probably more of a gearhead than you are an audiophile. Because if you're just a true audiophile and you're happy with your system, you may not be watching this type of stuff. I know some people have pretty solid systems that they're not changing out and they still watch because they're interested in the hobby. I get that. But if it acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims, it's probably a duck and we're probably gearheads and there's nothing wrong with that. Coming in from Eric Rhodes and Steve Rigdon. I'm just gonna put these together. How big a pain in the air is editing the videos and what camera gear do you use and what software do you use for editing? Thanks. I use Final Cut for editing, but like, it's not about the camera that you use and it's not about the editing software. Um, it's about how you use them. And trust me, I'm not very good. I look at people like John Darko, uh, Andrew Robinson, uh, Skylabs Audio, Kevin is just crushing it. And I look at those guys and they, you can tell they spend so much effort, so much time and put in so much effort on videos. For me, editing's not that really, editing's not that big of a deal anymore because I've edited over a thousand videos and I can do it fairly quickly. And <laughs> my threshold for what is good enough for a video is much lower than many of my peers. So sometimes it can be a bit of a pain, but I can still edit a video in an hour, hour and a half. If it's really complicated video, maybe three hours. Like my videos that I did in Italy, those were much more involved than the videos I usually do here. Here, I usually do some B-roll, grab some screenshots, roll the camera, and I don't generally script out a video, but I just roll the camera, riff for a little while, throw some B-roll on top of it, and I'm done. But specifically, this is a Sony A7 IV, I think. And then this lens that I'm using is a 24 millimeter 1.4 G Master. But most of this stuff comes down to like lighting. You don't need a super expensive camera or super expensive lens. You put a light at, I don't know, 45 degrees off axis and then you light up one side of your face. You make the background a little bit darker and Bob's your uncle. So you can make anything, you can make a cell phone look really good with proper lighting. On an iPhone, if you drop it down 0.7 stops below what it thinks it should be, as far as your ISO, it'll look really good. The colors on iPhones look like garbage though. Final Cut Pro, Sony camera, Sony lens, but I have, this Sigma is an old Sigma, is a 35 millimeter 1.4. This thing's a beast. Very nice. Dropped it a few times, as you can tell. Still works though. I like a 24 millimeter or 20 millimeter because I can put the camera right here, whereas a 35 millimeter, I'd have to have it across the room. Yeah, probably more information than most people want to hear though. Matthew Williams coming from Patreon. Do you think Fozzie and Aima will start to move up the audio manufacturing and make bigger and more expensive units with internal power supplies, integrated amps, etc.? I don't know if Aima will. Fozzie's got a pretty, uh, Fozzie has vision. I'm not saying Aima doesn't have vision, but Fozzie really is trying to move things forward. So maybe they will. I think it comes down to costs because I think Aima and Fozzie are very small outfits. So it just depends on where they see the market going. Right now, I think it's easy to make inexpensive Class D amps based on the 3255 Texas Instruments amp chipset. If anybody was going to do it, I would think that Fozzie would do it. And Fozzie actually had a Class AV amplifier three, four years ago that was like $200 or $300. I think it was pretty good. But kind of going back to what I talked about before with weight, and I think it's a big risk for Fozzie Audio to put a bunch of money into a Class AB amplifier or into a product that has an, an internal power supply because there's work involved with that. And I think it's easier with the external like 48 volt, five amp, 48 volt, 10 amp power supplies because it's, it's a known thing. They know that they can buy this one and it works. They know they can 
put some really high-end capacitors or other components in an existing design and make it better. They can improve the cooling. So I would think that something with an internal power supply, although it would be awesome, I don't know if we're gonna see it. But if we do see it, I think it's gonna come from Fozzie. Ross Teasley, why are there so few streamers with Wi-Fi? I don't know if, <laughs> most require ethernet cables. Do you think there is a notable sound quality difference between a strong Wi-Fi signal and direct cables? Well, I do think there's a, a ton of streamers out there with Wi-Fi. Everything from Weem, the Cambridge Audio stuff, the, the um, EverSolo stuff, even the iFi Zen stream, all of them work off of Wi-Fi. Do I think it's better as far as Sonics? I think it's better because of like not having any internet dropouts, but if it's a FLAC file, it's a FLAC file. So I think you're just gonna have dropout of the signal. If you are doing AirPlay or Bluetooth, if the signal degrades and you get a de degradation of the resolution of the file. But if you're streaming FLAC, ALAC, WAVE, or anything like that, you're getting what you're getting. Either it is or it isn't. I think, I think the biggest difference in streamer sonics come from the DAC that you have connected to it. And most of these streamers, you can connect an outboard DAC. So I think when you do that, it kind of levels the playing field a lot. You can argue that power supplies and other things can make a difference, and they do make a difference in the sonic characteristics of a streamer. But I would worry more about the DAC and then the power supply on a streamer than anything else. But as far as Wi-Fi versus hardwired, I don't think it makes any difference.